Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Jess Hilarious, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Man. Kingsley Benadir. Did I Yo. say that right? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. he is yeah, playing uh, Bob Marley in the new movie, Bob Marley, One Love yes. Story, which comes out Valentine's Day. Welcome. Nice to be here. How you feeling? I feel all right, man. Mm -hmm. I had a good, nice weekend of sleeping. Yeah. Oh, yeah? So I feel back. Oh, you Enjoy went to football? Me. We went to the basketball. I watched some football yesterday. Okay. Pre Premier League, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was well, I was listening anyway on my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, did was you it? like the halftime? Oh, the football. Yeah, he's from Britain. He's from Britain. So you think I'm talking soccer? Oh, yeah. football. American, football. American football. Oh, last night. No, I, I just I tuned in on my phone just to see Usher. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I watched I watched a little bit of the game, but I don't really know. Don't, I don't really know understand American it too much. football. Okay. That's how I am with it's soccer. A big, big deal here. Yeah. Yeah. It's big. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I see Usher. I was madness. Mm -hmm. I forgot he had so many hits. Yeah. It just went on and on and on. <laughs> yes. And then I was back to my, like, when I was eight. Yeah. And I was back yeah. to when I was 11. Mm -hmm. Then I was back to when I was 16. I was like, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was in full swing. That's right. He was. He didn't look like an older guy who was coming back. He you looked like it was he like was, being. He never back left. Then. <laughs> yeah, he, he never, never left. left. <laughs> he never left. Like, to me, the Super Bowl is a celebration. Yeah. You know, a celebration of his, 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 his catalog, his career. You know what I mean? Huge yeah. catalog. Yeah, man. That's, yeah. that's beautiful to have a 30 year catalog and be able to go do it's that crazy. on that stage, especially after the residency last, last year. Yeah, right. he has a residency in Vegas. Right. So he's mm -hmm. on the stage every okay. week. Okay. Because yeah. back home, he's sort of like, yeah, he was a part of my, my, my childhood, my teens and my mm -hmm. 20s. And then. I feel like he's sort of disappeared a bit. But it was just so was many like, other uh -uh. people that came, and then he, yeah, so it was saturated. Right. But where your locks at? Well, they're, they're gone. They're in a they're in a they're in a cupboard <laughs> you somewhere. Left them in the movie. They left some, the movie. They, they took them off. Set. Put put them in a box. Okay. And locked them up. Whoever did that did a great job. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, usually, you see people with dreadlocks and they look so stupid. The fake yeah. dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. Morris yeah. Morris and Carla, man, they put they put they were they were prepping that from the same time when I started prepping. So it was mm -hmm. like Morris is a he's a dread specialist, and you know it's not even just. The hair he did for me, he took all them boys who came from Jamaica, they're all mm -hmm. Rasta. Mm -hmm. So he took out their dreads, you know, by hand and he put them in like sacred boxes, stored them and then wow. redid their, put new dreads in their hair um, what? to like suit the characters mm -hmm. from the time. And then when the film was done, he got their dreads and he put them back in. Wow. But for a lot of them, it was it was really emotional and mm -hmm. they was doing it for Bob because they love Bob and they're all connected mm -hmm. to Bob, you know. A lot of them, a lot of the guys who are playing the band members are the children of the actual band members. Mm -hmm. So they're all rust and they took out their hair for the film and then they, they put it back. It was a lot, you know, it was... Um, what do you mean took the hair out? Like, they got, ex what do you mean took it out? So like Sheldon came with his own dreads. Real, mm -hmm. real hair. Real dreads. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then Morris took them out. Cut them out. Like, picked them out and left hair there and Not then re-put yeah, dreads in. Them out. And then at the end of the film, He's taken out them dreads and then put their original dreads back in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the whole dreads thing was like, that was one of the first conversations I had with Ziggy. It was like, yo, authenticity of, of how Bob speaks, mm -hmm. you know, has to be at the forefront of this. So I, was, I can't get involved. And he was the same, you know, and, and, and also the hair. I was like, it's not, I, I ain't got nothing to do with it, but just yeah. make sure that if you need to put 10 million into the hair, then that's what we need to do. Absolutely. So, you know, it was um yeah, the hair and the the hair and the the, the Bob talk was, was no, tough. I'm a little slow, Kingsley. How the hell do you put the hair back in? I don't taking know. it out. I ain't got a clue. It's all He's a specialist. Types of YouTube tutorials on how to put some we are not gonna sit here. Well, it'll grow back like regular hair. How he Cause, do no, his cause, hair. Cause they had to, they would have had to cut it out. You have to cut it out and then no. sew it back in? No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So locks you you comb them out. Yeah. Like you can comb yeah. them out. And, and, and the they box. lose hair. Yeah, you comb them out and then you People make the locks that I had last week. Last week, the girl made them with out of real hair. Yeah. These are faux locks. So these are from Amazon, like nineteen yeah. ninety. Okay, but man. you know, yeah. the I real didn't ones know. They, they, I didn't yeah. know that. I, I didn't yeah. know it was a it's thing. A I, and, I, and I, I met them once. The new hair had been put in, so mm. I only knew them with that hair. I only mm. realized when I see them after that they had different dreads. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, it was a whole. Um, I don't know how we found him, yeah. Morris, because he's he's like. You know, he's a one of a kind, you know, that was in the in the industry, you know. He mm -hmm. came and he, and then he ended up just taking care of a lot of stuff, you know. He was on set with us every day. I know he's working with Lashana now on all of our work. Well, salute to Mars. The British accent isn't that much different from the Jamaican accent, though, now that I'm hearing you talk right yeah. now. Maybe, is Ooh. it because he spent so much time? I don't know. I, yeah. I disagree. I, I feel yeah. like, I feel like, you know, the the wind, like the black, uh, 
the black community in 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 London anyway was you know it's a huge Caribbean culture, mm-hmm. and I feel like a lot of Jamaican dialect has seeped into to London culture. So you know the way we grew up talking was half Cockney, half Jamaican. That's kind mm-hmm. of what the slang is in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the patois really for me is a different language. You know, I tell you what, we could be in here with two guys from Jamaica who are like from somewhere, I don't know, and they could talk for five, 10 minutes and we wouldn't have a clue what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and I, I found myself in that situation a bunch of times and I was like, well, this is a whole, mm-hmm. yeah. this is a whole thing. This is not something where I can just like take nine months and learn mm-hmm. Jamaican. It mm-hmm. just was never gonna be one of those ones. So we had a whole operation in place, you know, we had like nine specialists on set. We had Jamaican linguists from the university. They They wrote, my script and the way that I talk in a in a phonetic language uh, made by Frederick Cassidy, mm. and so it really it really did you know like there's parts like I had I took months to t- kind of translate wow. everything Bob was saying. So they put I was money mi- and time into this film. Yeah, I, I was misinterpreting things Bob was saying. Do you know what I mean? It's Missing like what? I was Interpreting misinterpreting things, things oh, he was saying. Yeah. I wasn't just not understanding. There was things that I thought I understood, mm-hmm. and then actually. I get a Jamaican to come around to my house and help me translate, and he's going, no, 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 this he's saying something else. Give us an example. In our farm where, Bob would say this thing when he's saying our farm where, in our farm where, you know, and he's saying in a, in a form where. So it was just a connecting sentence, mm-hmm. but little things like that in the middle of conversations throw you, you know, and like, in a form was, I mean, in, in, a, in a form where, you know, it's yeah. just like, it's just a, an expression that he, 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 and Bob talked the way that Bob talked, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's- mm. I still don't know what that means. And you said it three times, in a form where. Yeah. So would it be like, from a standpoint of- Exactly. Right. Exactly. Oh. It's just regular And I was English. like, oh. without yeah. Jamaicans, there's no way that I was going to be able to Understand translate that. something. Mm-hmm. I mean, and the list goes on. I mean, I had hundreds of pages of, yeah. of Bob talk where I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what he's saying. Yeah. So, would you say that was the most complicated part of the role? Of, yeah, of, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Obviously, the music I'm starting from scratch, mm-hmm. but with the music, I'm I was always like, I just get as far as I can get to, you know. And then you can do things with the camera, and there's going to be a lot of support there. But I guess with the with the patois, there was a moment where I thought, oh, let me see how far I can get with this. And mm-hmm. then a few months in, I was I was emailing Tough Gong going, we need a lot need of help. help. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not gonna be able to just come in and willy nilly patois. It's yeah. not, it's not, it's not one of them things there. And I'm like, just because I've grown up with Jamaicans, just because, you know, it, it don't mean anything really. Like the language, you could mm-hmm. spend 10 years mm-hmm. trying to prep Bob and still have a way to go. Um, and Bob's coming from, he's born in the country, grew up in Trenchtown and then traveled. So there's the patois, but then there's how Bob talked mm-hmm. and how Bob talked, no one talked like him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was a journey, but there wasn't a day on set where I wasn't surrounded by people who knew. So I felt, I felt good, like we were never gonna move on mm-hmm. unless it was right. So, and that was the one thing I felt like I can fully take care of. Mm-hmm. I can't take care of like, looking exactly like Bob. Bob's 5'7", I'm 6'2". You know, there's so many physical differences between us. And he's a genius, he's a musical genius. So like, but his voice and how he spoke and the authenticity of that as like the whole cultures in the way that Bob talks, Mm -hmm. like the way that he speaks has to be reflected. There's Mm -hmm. no, there can be no dumbing down of it. Like there's no whitewashing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then let's, let's, let's do it how Bob talks. And then afterwards, when you are in post-production, you can figure out Fix how it. much people understand and what, how much they don't. What made you audition for this? At first, I, I thought, at first I was, um, I thought there must have been a, a mistake of some sort, you know, just one of them auditions where I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm mixed, so. Oh, they reached I out guess, to you? I guess everyone mixed is auditioning for this, and right. I just thought yeah. it was silly. And so I, I must have passed on it, just thinking it was like a general, you know, hundreds of us doing it. And then it just started coming back that, the Marley family were involved, which I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And then I heard that Ray had done King Richard and I saw an early cut of it. And I was like, oh, if the family are involved then there's, there's nothing to lose, you know, let me, let me throw something out there and then at least we can have a conversation if they want, but nothing to lose. Um, and then I auditioned and Ziggy wanted to meet me. So really it was, it was really spending time with the family and understanding that 
they wanted to do a kind of tribute to their dad, you know, it was a kind of love letter to their dad. And they wanted to share with the fans a side to Bob that people don't mm -hmm. necessarily know, which is that he was a human being, you know, which was that he was a guy who went through a lot and man struggled. And so... Yeah, I think they talk about his revolution and not a revolution a lot, but you don't get to see what fueled him being a revolutionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I f yeah. And that he... um. And that at this time with the film set, like he was just going for a lot, you know? He, yeah. had, he, had, he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. And mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, it was really the family, like mm -hmm. the family's involvement and an understanding that authenticity was really Im most important for them and for the studio and for me. So, you know, I was just being in service to them. The kids uh, didn't weren't upset about you playing the father? Like none of them wanted to play the role? No. They picked you. No. I think Skip I think Skip auditioned to play the younger Bob and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Um to find Bob it's the thing about casting, you know, so many stories and people's feelings, you know, get mm -hmm. hurt and stuff. But when you when you're when you're on the inside, you're like, Oh, it's not the conspiracy that everyone thinks. Mm -hmm. You know? Or Ziggy and that they don't want to play their dad. And they're older. You got they needed to find someone to play Bob between 33 and 36 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's pretty, you know, it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. And so, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Ziggy, Ziggy and the family, they they approved it. And so I was like, all right, cool. If you lot, if you lot, if that's what you lot want, then, you know, I'm here to help. Did you ever want to quit? Cause you said it was difficult with the hair, difficult with the patois. Did you ever say, you know what? Maybe the same for me. Yeah, I did. At what point? Very close to filming. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, if I pull out of this, you know, it's not just me. It's all the money that's gone into pre-production. And it's like, if you want to work again, I wouldn't advise doing that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, I, did have, I did have a moment, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks before we started, I was just like, boy. A lot it of feels pressure. like there's a mountain to climb, you know, and all of the music and, and the stems were coming in and songs were changing. And I was like, yeah, just one day at a time. It's just one day at a time. And, and and really, really what happened was we got to set and Neville Garrick's there, who was Bob's like close, close friend, who was with Bob the whole time, you know, the whole time Bob was creating Exodus and touring Exodus. Neville was with him, Neville was in the room with Bob, writing down the songs when Bob was composing them. And Neville was on stage, all of them concerts, and Neville was with me every day on set. So I felt like, if Neville didn't like something, he's gonna tell me straight, and he did a lot of times. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just always felt if something's not right, we've got the time to like stop and figure it out. And really, it's only this is just a tribute to Bob to try and find a little bit of his spirit and his essence. I feel like everyone involved knows that you can't copy Bob and you can't be Bob. He's kind of too big in a way. Mm -hmm. So it was just there was an understanding that this is just an interpretation of, you know. His, his vulnerability and his feeling and what some of what he might have been going through at that time and you know just to celebrate him a little bit how much how much hair did you need because you you got oh, a lot of head. yeah you, you was bald underneath the the thing you yeah. got a lot of head kingsley pause i got a big head hey, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> did you need a lot of hair he, he back on your head <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> like jesus <laughs> i got a big head yeah yeah, they used to call me Big Head at school. Yeah, oh. yeah, but what? So what? What do you mean? I don't how, know. How I, did, I, I'm be honest. Your head was just distracting me, so I had to say something. <laughs> so listen, let me tell you something. I'm happy that this movie is coming out on Valentine's Day because it's not just a story about Bob. It's a love story mm. between Bob and Rita. Mm -hmm, man. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I liked about it. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? Yeah, I didn't really know. I mean, that sort of evolved as we were shooting. Yeah. Um, Lashana, Lashana and I, we were working seven months leading up to filming and I guess, th that's the thing with films, you shoot three and a half, mm. four hours and then they cut it down to two. Yeah. So all the things that stay in and don't stay in and how they kind of tweak it and, and kind of make it is, you know, it's over to them after you, after you rap. But it is, it is it's, it's, a, it's a love story between them and, but more that kind of unconditional love when you've known someone for that long and mm. you've shared all that experience and the love that is expressed when you're not talking, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the, when there's no words. Um, but yeah, it is that. And she was his motivation a lot, because I mean, one thing I didn't even know, I, I, I can't be giving the movie away because it's a biopic, but <laughs> when she, I didn't know she got shot at the house too. Yeah, they shot her in the head. Yeah, and I didn't dread, realize that until the movie. Her dread, 
the the bullet got lodged in one of the dreads. Yeah. How mad is that? Man. Mm. They really went in and shot up that place. Mm. You know, they really all nearly died. Yeah. And that was what was really, for me, when I was reading the script, I was like, how mad is it that out of that trauma of that event, you know, within a few months, Bob's created one of the greatest albums of all time. And that, there's a connection between that. There's mm -hmm. a connection between that. That the significance of that trauma and then the mm. intensity of creativity and then coming to London in a kind mm. of exile and then just going in and then all the all the surviving band members who I spoke to who we've sadly lost, you know, since we started filming, mm. Neville and Tyrone, they all said, I was like, what was it like working with Bob at that time? And it was like, it was intense. It was intense. Like he wasn't playing, you know, he wasn't messing around. And so, yeah, that, that I, I found that interesting that like, Raw, they all nearly died, and then within you know twelve weeks, fourteen weeks, they were up and running and touring. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of that was Bob's vibe, you know. He worked. He was a worker, man. He was up before the sun. Were you into Bob Marley growing up as a kid? Did you know all the music and know everything about him? Was a lot of this you learned as filming? I feel it? like I learned everything about Bob um, for the first time. Really, I felt I felt like I knew him just because I've always known him. Known the music. I don't even know when I, I don't even know when I really first heard Bob because Bob's mm -hmm. just always been in the house and Notting Hill Carnival was a big thing growing up. And I was getting Carnival from when I was like three, mm -hmm. three, four years old. Um, but once I started checking in, I was like, well, I really don't know anything about this guy mm -hmm. other than that I knew he's half white, you know, like he's, he's mixed and he's mixed. That was it. Yeah. Like I didn't really understand like, He's really from the ghetto, like he really grew up mm -hmm. in Trenchtown. And yeah, there's a lot of sides to Bob. Um, so I say I, f I found out everything for the first time through his friends and through his family. I spent a lot of time with people who grew up with Bob before he was famous, which was some of my most interesting conversations, mm -hmm. you know, Lego. I spent time with him on Orange Street and in his studio just talking about the old time, but watching them remember Bob, like watching them remember him with such fondness and sadness and love. You know, it's really just trying to get, the information I'm trying to get from them is like, what was Bob like when he was on his own? Mm -hmm. What was Bob like when he was just like feeling down? Like what was Bob like when he was having a rough day? Like the idea of him as an icon and all of that, that's, they're the sound bites everyone wants to tell you. They want to tell you all the mm -hmm. fun bits that you've seen and you've seen them in the documentary mm -hmm. saying it, but trying to understand just like his, like. Like his humanity a little bit. So you can bit. lock into the role. You yeah, know just I mean? so I can, I can connect him as a human Definitely. being mm -hmm. and not like a a hero. Yeah. Like that's a given, you know, that's a given. Um, Did you do all of the singing and the movie? Like, I sung everything. I sung everything on okay. set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which it, it was never the plan for me to sing in the film. We're always going to use Bob's stems because people want to listen to Bob. They don't want to listen to me. Right. And no one can <laughs> sing like Bob. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. sing like Bob because he's singing from such... A, it's so rough, but it's so from here mm -hmm. that it's actually it's actually his commitment to what he's saying that creates that energy as well as his tone and all of those things. So you can't really copy it as as beautifully as all his sons can sing. No one can actually get his match. So <clears throat> and he was an ordained messenger. Like I feel like he was divinely appointed to be a messenger because that's what his name meant, right? Like. Nesta the messenger, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Bob felt like he was in service. You know, mm -hmm. he felt like he was, he was in service to his Majesty. You know, so he's singing, he's singing for his life in a way. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's about yeah, it's about spreading the message and mm -hmm. all of his songs. You know, when you clock all, when I started translating the lyrics of all of his songs, I was like, bro, God is really in all of this, absolutely, all of his music, absolutely. jamming like all of them songs. He's talking about God. You know, it's mm -hmm. um really fascinating. Um, but yeah, I sung, I sung, I sung everything because, uh, like, emotionally speaking, in the face, if you're not singing, I don't think I didn't feel like I could pretend. But also, that Bob woke up every day and and wrote songs. I felt was like if I was playing a footballer and I never kicked the ball. So I just wanted to learn to just understand what yeah. the feeling with the instrument is and the feeling of just the feeling of it, you know. Yeah. Um, and then in, in the room, we did some acoustic stuff and Ziggy was supposed to come and dub it and he left my voice. So there's a bit of me singing in the film, which was never planned. 
But I had, I had months of singing lessons, so I'm glad they came. I was going to ask you what, to what level of expertise was your voice on before Not this? great. Not, not great. great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. At least you can admit that. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Not great at all. Not great at all. you got to look after your instrument, man. Those mm. singers, they got to look after their voices, you know? It's mm. like right. steaming and all of that stuff. Mm. What was your conversation with, uh, with, with Rita like? Because she's the EP of the film, right? Rhea, Rhea, Lashana spent most time with Rhea. Okay. Um, I see I see her the other day at the premiere in um, Jamaica, and I just went over to her and I kissed her hand and stuff, and then she just, she rubbed her hand up the back of my head and then slapped me on the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> How big are her hands? I don't know what that meant, but I was Jesus. like, yeah. I think she was commenting on my bald head, or, my oh. big, or maybe my big head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but she's really is cool. I didn't I didn't spend too much. My, I was mainly with Ziggy and Ashana spent a lot of time with Sadella and Rita and I spent time with Ryan and Steven and a lot of Bob's friends and mm -hmm. people who worked with him. But yeah, obviously our first thing is don't look nothing like Bob. I think you, you did know? a great job as, as Bob Marley, right, <coughs> personally. But I feel like there's something the movie didn't capture and I think it was the urgency of the moment, meaning mm -hmm. the concert. Because there was mm -hmm. so much leading mm -hmm. up to it, like they people didn't want him to do it. He got shot. Rita got shot. Dan got shot. Mm -hmm. like, it was kind of like it was kind of anticlimactic in the movie. Happened right too fast, in, the, in the first concert. The first concert. The yeah. first concert. Yeah. I mean, all I can say is like what we were saying before. We shoot. I shot four hours and twenty minutes, mm -hmm. four and a half hours of movie. You know, I I I I created maybe like. Seven, eight, nine different concert things. There's five or six songs that are not in the film. There are deleted scenes. There's all of that going on. So like when it comes down to the cut, I'm not in the edit, you know, like I can't, my job is to come in as an actor and understand what Bob's psychology is from a human standpoint. So I can play Bob in any film. In fact, I told them when I first started this, I read it once and I was like, I don't need to read this. I need, just need six months with me and Bob, you know, so I need to get ready so I can play Bob in any film. In any scene, you send me any scene and I'll tell you how to interpret Bob within within that scene. Mm -hmm. And really as an actor, you got to give up that need to control everything because you can't, there's just too many departments. It's like mm -hmm. there's costume, there's hair, there's light and there's props. And then you start becoming an expert in, in the world that you're supposed to, you start noticing things around you. And it, there's a moment where you go like, and I'm bad for it. You know, mm -hmm. I want to do everyone's job for them. And like a sign I have to figure out. Um, and I just go, I'm just an actor. My job's to come in and play the damn scene. And that's it. Um, and try and elevate in the best way that I can. So, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not I'm not an editor. And, yeah. and it felt like, you know, even though it, sh it shows the rise of Bob Marley, in a lot of ways, Bob Marley was on the run. Like, he had to get mm. out of Jamaica. He, you know, he, he couldn't deal with the trauma that, that was there anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know what I mean? 100%. And for me... The movie was, for me, it was about trauma and safety. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm, as an actor, you're reading something and trying to go, where's the, what's the subtext here? Like, if they're, and, 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 and Ziggy and the family, again, to me, we want to make something deep. So I'm going, well, if you want to make something deep, then I need to understand Bob's trauma because that's all, that, that's all it means. Right. Deep means just like connecting to the root. And so understanding Bob's experience as a child and the manifestation of that in behavior, so like, like, what does it mean to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when you don't trust people? Mm -hmm. When you've grown up, do you know yeah. what I'm saying? When you've grown up in the street, so that mm -hmm. that's I'm trying to clock Bob mm -hmm. in those terms, and then trying to see how it connects into the music. He doesn't sing with his eyes open ever. Really, he's always closed. What does that mean? That they're the things I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Like. You can stand on stage, he sings from here. And so there's something about all of that. But safety really, to me, I was like, what does it mean to not feel safe, you know? What does it mean to, ha what does it mean to nearly die? And what does it mean? And, then, and, that, and that needs to come through every scene that I'm in in the mm -hmm. film. Bob's relationship to safety. Right. Um, we all wanna feel safe as well. Like on a human level, I feel like we're all on some sort of journey towards wanting to feel connected, loved, together, seen, appreciated. And I was like, Bob must have felt those things too. So 
peace, love and unity spreading it to the world. But like, where was Bob at with those things in himself? Where mm -hmm. was Bob at with his inner peace? Mm -hmm. Where was Bob at with his, with his sense of unity within himself? How safe did he feel? Because out of trauma can come mad creativity mm -hmm. and we'll all pick up on the magnetism of it. You know, we'll all pick up on the energy of that vibration mm -hmm. because you, that trauma mixed with all of that talent, bosh, it's gonna come with some energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in love, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know what I'm talking about now. I can't remember. <laughs> I, love I love it. But yeah. I, I imagine that it, it's, it's probably impo almost impossible to capture all of that in one movie For anyway. Sure. It's right. like, you For know, sure. the, the things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. other, you know, leading up to him being what made him a, re a revolutionist, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It, it's probably like, that would be part two and part three. Those I, are different. There's 20, there's 20 films you can make about Bob. You I can know. make Zimbabwe. It's still not be done probably. You know, you could do Concrete Jungle. Yeah. I'm gonna go straight to the end. Mm -hmm. You know, you could do the whole Africa story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to hear more about it because exactly. he, he wanted and to be I, in Africa so yeah, bad. I yeah, and, 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 I, and I feel like a lot of people everyone's gonna come in with their own expectation of mm -hmm. what they want to see because everyone has their own idea of who Bob Marley is to them. Mm -hmm. and, and trust me, I'm that guy. Like I'm the worst critic when it comes to these things. I'll be the first person to say like, why is this English guy playing Bob? That's me when I'm at home. Yeah. So I get it, I fully, fully get it. But this is a project made by the family Everything went through them, and this is their tribute to their father, right. and this is what they want the world to know about their dad. I shot everything, and I had every difficult conversation I needed to have with them about everything to the point where I wasn't always popular. Popular among who? The family? Everyone, or? because okay. I'm coming in, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm trying to get into Bob's, I have the responsibility of, of playing him and wanting to truthfully get into his headspace. So I have to ask all the questions, you know? And it's a, and, and when I'm working, it's like, there's never a moment like, we got it, and now we can all just have a good time on mm -hmm. set. It's mm -hmm. a constant investigation yeah. to the last day. If something doesn't feel right on set, we stop. We stop, and if no one knows the answer, let's listen to Bob. So the, the one thing I could take full control of is how Bob talks, and no one listened to him more than me. I listened to Bob every day for nine months and Sadella sent me files that only the family had got where Bob's having conversations with people that no one's heard before. So I know how I know what Bob's spiritual, emotional point of view is because I'm hearing him say it. Mm -hmm. So if I see a scene and I'm like, Bob would Bob needs to be saying this now as it relates to God, as it relates to spirituality. So <clears throat> for me, sometimes, you know, my job is just the character, mm -hmm. you know? It's the character. Um, Which was executed very well. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. These yeah. past couple of years, you played like different characters though. You you played uh, Barack Obama, you uh, you played Malcolm X in One Night in Miami, Basketball Ken in a Barbie movie. Basketball Ken, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and Bob Marley, how mentally is that, like how how is that mentally to switch like no, that? I don't find, I don't find the switching I feel like problem? nah yeah for me it's just more it's a it's a preparation thing and then five minutes before action I just need to concentrate and make sure I've done my homework and I know what I'm doing do you know what I mean I, I don't feel it's um yeah you want to be able to I, I think as well just coming up as a as a working actor mm -hmm. you have to be ready when you need to be ready mm -hmm. so there ain't, there's not that luxury of of like I'm doing this role and now I've got six months to prepare on my own. It's like someone's dropped out. You got two weeks to prep one night in Miami. So you just have to get ready. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you finish Secret Invasion on the 12th of March, you're starting Barbie on Monday. So you just, That's you know what I mean? You gotta stay. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing that role because I would, the reason why I took it, it wasn't because the writing was great at all. It's nothing to do with the writing. They just sent me two little teaser scenes, one with Samuel at the end and one with Ben Mendelsohn. And I was like, "Raw, this guy really wants to, everyone to burn. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's no, I feel like he's gone in his mind, he's mm -hmm. gone. Like- Power hungry. Power hungry, but also <clears> just <throat> like, He's only gonna feel, I don't think he feels anything other than when he sees other people experiencing the pain that he feels, subconsciously or not. So like, 
he only feels alive when I see you in as much pain as I feel in myself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't, I've never been offered that kind of role. So I, I just have to take it mm -hmm. yeah. regardless of what show it is or, you know, yeah. what it's in. But it, it's fun. It's fun to play that because you just got a bag of secrets, bag of dark secrets. Yeah. What about the backlash that comes with being a British actor, getting to play American icons like President Obama, like Malcolm X, mm -hmm. even playing, you know, a Jamaican icon like Bob Marley. You know, yeah. People do not like that. People yeah, feel yeah, like y'all yeah. stealing all the roles yeah, from yeah, American actors. Yeah, yeah, actor. no. I hear it. I hear it. I, get, I feel like. when you each casting situation is different so when it comes to opportunity the first question is has everyone had an opportunity to audition has everyone who should had an opportunity to put their foot in the door where they get to put their best self forward mm -hmm. and then what only like and where it just depends on the casting is that each situation's different. So some people can't get their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth choice, all busy, not available. Seventh choice would be amazing. He's not finishing the job till February. When these films go, when they get that green light, there's a moment where they're trying to make it now. They're not waiting for anyone. So it really becomes about availability. Um, I will always make, I told, I said, when they came to me with Bob, I was like, have you, have you been on a worldwide search? Yes, we have. Go on another one. Really make sure, you know, why when it came- you, Why would you say that? Like, make sure it's not me. <laughs> well, yeah, because you, there's- You wanna make sure you're the best person. You wanna make sure, you you wanna make sure yeah, exactly. Yeah. You wanna make sure I'm the best, best. person. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, because I've been in that situation before. I couldn't get an audition for any of those London, um, things like Kid mm. or Hood or Top Boy or any of that, the casting directors at home, they would never see me for that role because they see me like the Bridgerton guy. Mm -hmm. oh, Whereas wow. I'm like, yeah. no, 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 that's how I grew up. I just went to a drama school that knocked my accent out of me for eight years and I've just had to try and find it back. Mm. Some bullshit English institution that mm. told us that we couldn't talk the way that we were supposed to talk. Mm -hmm. So it really, really depends on the, the car. I think to talk about this, as a whole becomes really difficult. I can only talk for the specific examples of the castings that I've been in. And I'll tell you straight, Andre Holland dropped out of one night in Miami and Regina had two weeks to cast it. And then there was three of us. And then the guy who I was up against, he didn't have the experience to hold the film in the way that I did because of his age. He would have been a 27 year old Malcolm and it didn't make sense. Mm. They did not want to put me in that role. It was just because the film is about to go, they need to get it going, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, I, and and really I can talk for Bob and I can talk for that and that's it, you know? Like, so my I just gotta make sure that when I'm going in for something that my thing is who, who have you seen? Why are you coming to me? Yeah. You know, and I think the family came to me because our first conversation was about the emotional vulnerability of Bob. That's it, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. No mimicry, no impersonation, no trying to like, be him or copy him. This is a this is a this is a love letter to your father. So I'm gonna try and tap into his feeling a little bit, and that's it. Just a little bit of his essence, and I'm done. It's okay to say you good. It's okay to say I'm better than everybody else. It's okay to say I get these roles because I'm a great actor. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Okay. I, I, yeah. I like. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. Um. I just don't. I don't. I don't. I, well, at least I don't see it like that. Mm -hmm. Um because you're only as good as the work you put in on the day. You're, you're two seconds away from being really, really bad if you switch off. <coughs> and that's the way that I, I, I go at everything. It's starting again, you know, it's not like, mm -hmm. I went into Barbie with the same energy I went into Bob mm -hmm. because it's about the work and it's about the craft. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Maybe I need to chill out a little bit, but no, I feel like- No, you seem to be a critic of yourself. Like you seem to be even like, you know, hard on yourself about things. Do you ever give yourself bad reviews? Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm learning to I'm learning to be much kinder. Okay. Because it's you know it can just get tiring for yourself. But yeah, yeah. I know. I feel like, um, yeah. I feel like it's the work and it's the experience. You know, for me, it's about the experience mm -hmm. of the shoot. You know, who who's gonna what exp the the experience of making Bob was two years, getting to know him. 
with his friends and family. Before filming. Yeah, and mm -hmm. even up until now. Just spending time with the people who loved him, or love him, and knew him. Well, you did the work. Yeah. So, like, what a joy, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, regardless of the film and whatever happens with it, for mm -hmm. me, that's two years of my life. Right. That's my life yeah. with them, you know? And I'll cherish that two mm -hmm. years. So, for me, as, as well with work, it's as much about the experience as well. It's like when I see that Secret Invasion thing, I was like, yo, this is 10 days of Samuel Jackson on set. <laughs> I'm taking the job just for that. Because I yeah. just want to be around Ooh. him for 10 days, yes. you know? And it was right. ended up being three, four months. And then I get to learn from him, you know? What did he teach you? What was the lesson that he taught you? Pro. Pro. And like... Great cursor, too. Fantastic cursor. Loves cursing. cursing. And funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. funny. But when he's on the floor, you know, when we started doing some of those scenes, when he gets excited and wants to turn it on, it becomes really exciting because you're like... Sam can do it, you know, he's one of the greats. And um, I don't know I, I don't know how to summarize or word what I got from it, mm -hmm. but it was definitely like, you know, I really, really enjoyed being around him. And Ben Mendelsohn as well. Those two were the reasons why I took the job. I was like, I'm definitely gonna be able to learn Sam from these guys, you know? Um, and Sam, Sam's very kind, like mm -hmm. very, very kind. Mm -hmm. He's got so much time for like young people around. He mm -hmm. has a heightened awareness of like, I mean, he's been famous for how long, man? He can't go Ooh. anywhere, but he still makes the time for everyone. Still. And he said, Sam likes to do one take or two takes, you know, one and done. Sometimes I need eight or nine, and he's there. He's there. You take as much time as you need, I'm right here, and he'd be on his feet every time, and I wow. love that, because a lot of actors will go back to their trailer, they go home, and they'll get their stand-in to come in and act with you. Sam did not leave me once. Wow. I'm very patient. Um, yeah, so I really appreciated that, and uh, just funny. Funny. Did um did Ziggy really remember a lot of stuff? Cause he was young then. Like like the scene I'm thinking about in particular was the shooting that happened. You know, yeah, the, yeah. the drive by. He remembered that. They've got they've got yeah. Ziggy's got memories. Yeah, wow. Ziggy's got memories. And that bit at the airport at the end, somehow when his dad come back, how the hell I didn't understand that. Ziggy either. Ziggy made it to the airport and no one knew how he got there at like nine years old. He heard mm. his dad was coming and he found himself. Like running in the crowd, he running in the crowd, and no one knows how he got there. He can't remember how he got there, but he was there. Mm -hmm. So I was about getting that moment in. But no, and that really happened. Like Bob, Bob saw him in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I believe wow. so. But the 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 that's why a lot of my conversations with Neville and with Tyrone and with Lego, like the guys who are Bob's age, mm -hmm. who remembering him like I would remember my pal. You know, they were really the stories about Bob's personality and his feeling around the time you know all my information came through them as mm -hmm. it related to that um and you read all the books and then it's like there's nothing you can find in these books really apart from timelines you know mm -hmm. um but lego and and lenny lenny dread there's a guy called lenny dread mm -hmm. who came over from saint kitts when he was like 16 17 and he camped outside bob's mum's house in miami because he had a vision that he wanted to work for bob one day so he just went and stayed outside the house for weeks and Bob was on tour. And then Bob came back one day and he told Bob that he had a dream that he wanted to work for him. Man still works in the house today. Wow. Mm. And I spent three hours with him in, in Bob's mum's house and he took me into you know Bob's room at the time. It's where they would have had all family birthdays mm. and everything like that. Mm. And I had a four hour conversation with him where he was telling me like what Bob was like and his energy and I'd be one and then and then. Those were the things that I think I absorbed in some way you know, from, from those guys. Um, yeah, Lenny Dread and Desi and Lego it was what, great. What about when uh, Bob was dealing with, you know, the cancer that ultimately took his life? In the movie, it's played in like a really nonchalant way. Yo, mm. you was telling the, the movie, yeah. yo. I know it's, it's a, a real biopic. Bio people don't know the story like, in depth, though. You like, what are you talking anymore. about? Bob Marley's the icon. But some people Everybody don't know, know the story the No, you don't know the story in depth. And if I don't know the story in don't depth, I don't know the story in depth. It's Bob Marley. Like, come on. Yeah, I don't think that. I don't give too much away because everybody Thank knows you. that. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, no, you're good. Kingsley, I, 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 but the, I, I, but the, the, the nonchalantness of it, of it all. It, 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 it also reminded me of just being a man and how a lot of men don't want to go to the Well, doctor. yeah, it wasn't written like that. Okay. And that's what I'm saying about acting process. For me, I was like, when you're from the ghetto like that, and I've grown up with guys like that, and I have a bit of it in myself, whereas to me it was like, 
Well, what happened was that he didn't check it for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And the line really is, them can't rise, kill me. So if you understand the language of that scene, it, like it, we, we readjusted it to, to make sense for Bob's mentality at that moment, you know? I think the, the next diagnosis in New York three years later was slightly different. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to impose, the script I originally read sort of imposed 1981 on 1977. But I was like, where was Bob actually at in 77? Which is that he was on job, you know, he was working, he didn't have time for that, you know? And, I, and listen, I shot that film with Ziggy and it was a mad day because suddenly I'm in this doctor's office and I was like, right, this actually happened, you know? And his son's looking at me, you know? And I had to take a couple of moments because there were versions of the scene where I did crack. And I would mm. call Ziggy over and I'd say, Ziggy, I don't know if these are my tears or your dad's tears, but if they're not, I don't know. You know, if I'm crying for him, I'm crying. I don't, I don't wanna, you can't just put Bob Marley in a film and have him cry down the, the film. Yeah. You know, it's not that. Bob's not that. He's not an American dad. He have very, very specific political, spiritual, religious beliefs. And it's the only thing he talks about. From 1969, the first interview I heard, all the way through Bob saying the same thing, Ali Selassie, God. So Bob's tears, I'd ask people, there's not many reports. So it's not about an Oscar moment. Yeah. It's like the truth is it's not. So I said to Ziggy, you make this call when you get to the edit, but I'm gonna give you a few different versions of this, you know? And I love what they did up in the room when he's just there and you can't even see his face, but you just hear it. And then he cracks on, bosh, mm -hmm. back to the work. Mm -hmm. So that to me felt true to Bob. Mm -hmm. That felt true to that. Um, it felt true to the guy, I, the yeah. guy I know from the ghetto, mm -hmm. you know. So the emotions are really coming from the audience, pretty much. The tears really come from we the viewers. We cry for him, and, yeah. yeah. Right. As I was crying yeah. for him on the day, because mm -hmm. yeah. his son's looking at me, and I'm like, yeah, that must have been. What must that have been like for him? Right. Wow, like the the, the the loneliness of that moment, mm -hmm. and going raw, like everything's coming in, mm -hmm. and that's why you just see me looking up like that, because <coughs> when I don't want to cry. You know, it's that. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to see me cry. Well, I gotta hurry up and watch it. You know? I gotta so, hurry up and watch it. You like send me the movie before. Just <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta send me the movie. Send me the movie so I can watch it. Well, the movie comes out this Wednesday. <laughs> it looks like a globe was spinning. It's about your head again. My head, my head, my head. My head. <laughs> this Wednesday. Bring me back to my childhood. I was like, bro, I used to get, my head used to get terrorized in school. <laughs> I used to get terrorized. Me and another guy, he had, a, he had a bean head and I had a meat head. And there's some other kids are mean, huh? <laughs> kids are mean, yeah. you're probably the meanest. Could you imagine going to school with him? <laughs> yeah. He does that in the no, dope. It's like all my boys, and they come out, they're just terrorizing all day. <laughs> yeah. They're just terror. But have you seen his head? Huh? Have you seen his head? head? I ain't got a record. I would take it off. I saw your head, but you yeah, came okay. out there. Take it off, yeah. It's peanut head. Jesus Christ. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, peanut. it ain't little. I got a It's a lot of dimension to it. I got nub head. No, but right. no, the movie is really good, man. I think you did a great, great job as Bob. I don't have anything to reference it to. You know what I mean? Because I didn't grow up in the era of Bob Marley. Yeah, no, but no. I feel yeah. like you cap. There's an essence you captured for sure. Thank you, brother. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, I appreciate sure. it. Thank and everybody, go out and check it out. It comes out this Valentine's Day. A perfect Valentine's Day thing to it do is. Yes. with your boo. It's a love story, it man. Mm -hmm. Between Rita and Bob, it really, it really is. And Kingsley, we appreciate you for joining us this morning. It's so nice Absolutely. to be here, man. I'm a big fan of this show. I've been watching you a lot on YouTube all the time, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you. One more question: yeah. how, how hands on with Brad Pitt with all of this? Because I know Plan B was a production company. That's Brad's production. No, well, Dee Dee and, Dee and Jeremy are around. Brad's always busy filming, huh? Gotcha, gotcha. But gotcha. He's, he's the overseer. So gotcha. it's, it's the, oh, don't say that. No, no, no. The overseer of his company. Yeah, I don't, still don't like that. The well, overseer. Like, oh, well, overseer, well, overseer, overseer, overseer. You overseer, don't like overseer, that. Like, overseer, like, you can say what you want. He's the head of the oh, company. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I didn't mean that. Yeah. yeah. Brad's company is with Dee Dee and Jeremy. Yeah. But Dee Dee and Jeremy were with us. Gotcha. Brad oversees them. There you go. You know what I'm saying? Okay. But like, he's one of many executive producers on this. The overseer of this project is Tough Gong and the family. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Okay. The, Brad and Dee Dee and Jeremy, they come with a hell of a lot of experience 
you know, as it relates to these movies and the pre-production and the making of it and the coming out of it. So yeah, there's, yeah. I hope they yeah, do more stories. Gone. I really do. I yeah, hope Tough Gong doing. does more stories about that era. I really yeah, do. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there, you yeah. know. We'll see. Well, salute Absolutely. to the family, and we appreciate you for joining us. Kingsley, Thank Ben Adair. Thank you, guys. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Nice. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.